Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you everyone and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We are super excited. This is our second BotConf of hopefully many more to come. And today we wanted to share some research we have done on Ghostrat and pseudo manuscript with you all. First, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Jorge Rodriguez. I am the malware research team lead in the malware intelligence team at Intel 471. And we are mainly tracking malware through automated extraction of artifacts, which then we leverage for botnet emulation. I am Suel Hambo. I'm a senior malware reverse engineer with Intel 471. My main duties include uh, reverse engineer malware, writing comprehensive reports, uh, coding extractors and emulators to track malware and botnet activities. So the agenda we have for today is mainly focused on pseudo manuscript. We are going to do a deep dive later in the second part of the talk. But before doing so, we are going to set ourselves in a proper context on the Ghostrat the notable variants and some history on it. The pseudo manuscript rat was spot by Kaspersky in 2021. It was mainly delivered by fake crack websites and malware loaders. Later, later in August 2022, BitSight telemetry from their sinkholes saw that this botnet has around 50k bots, which is now being increased because this operation is ongoing. As we speak, is still relevant uh, today. We had to look deeper into it because we noticed the operation was rather active. So that's when Suhil realized this pseudo manuscript rat was actually one of the latest forks of the infamous cost rat which dates back from 20, uh, 2008, so Ghost is still hunting. It was open source that very same year and was mainly operated by Chinese actors. Many threat actor groups, both financially motivated and based in um, espionage, were incorporating these modified forks into their arsenal and is still relevant 15 years later. About the original developers of Kostrad, the C. Rufus security team, also known as Red Wall security team or CRST, it was mostly, mostly active between 2006 and 2009. They had around 12 plus members and they had these romantic ideas of themselves. They would claim they were passionate security professionals, they encouraged pure technical discussions, and they wanted to keep the internet a clean place. They actively developed Ghostrat between 2007 and 2009, where multiple variants were released, some of them to the general public. If we put this information on a timeline, it would look like something like this. On January 2008, we had the first stable release, March 2008, the first open source release for the 2.5 version. These releases have some internal comments from the developer Cool Dyer, and we could read some comments in the fashion after internal discussion with the team, we have decided to make this version open source, or then later the last known open source release from Ghostrat, version 3.6 beta, they claim, I can believe it, 3.6 will be open source. Signature cool liar. Only one month later, the inevitable happens. Cosnet campaigns are first spotted in the wild. They were targeting government office in more than 100 countries, and these attacks were attributed to Chinese-speaking threat actors. Later that year, December 2008, the last official release in a closed source format, we have COS 1.0, the alpha version. So it was becoming a notorious threat, 
back in the day, InfoWare Monitor released their investigation report in Ghostrat in March 2009, and the team behind Ghostrat was attracting lots of attention. Zero for security team activity reduced by that time, but the development possibly continued in private beyond this version 1.0 alpha. Um, actually, there were comments in subsequent variants from the same developer mentioning the, the chain lock, basically. And from here, we move into some features from the original Ghostrat. Thank you. So uh, both the panel and the bots in Ghostrat were written in C++. Uh, it's a rat, so it offers full-fledged control over the infected host and persists as a Windows Service DLL that runs as part of the network uh, services group. Uh, its protocol is a custom TCP communication protocol, uh, and the packet header starts with a special flag. In, in this case, it's ghost. In other variants, it's, uh, it can be another value. Uh, and this is followed by the packet size, including the header, the size of uncompressed packet, so that the bot can allocate the necessary memory to decompress the following Zlib compressed data. So uh, features are implemented in separate components called managers. Uh, each manager would inherit from a C manager class, uh, and new instances would get a new socket that is already connected to the command and control server. So to code a manager, um, basically you have to implement an abstract on receive method, uh, constructor of course, and uh, this uh, on receive method will generally implement a switch case statement to handle commands. So the main manager in Ghostrad is called the kernel manager. So its mission is to spawn new managers, uh, but also to handle miscellaneous commands, such as installing the bot, downloading, executing, uh, follow-up malware. Um, but it also has other managers, that, like the file manager, for example, the shell manager, uh, screen manager to spy on the screen, video and audio managers to spy on the uh, camera and, uh, and microphone, keyboard manager, access the keylogger, um, and others. So uh, between the uh, latest open source release and uh, the latest closed source release, there are a couple uh, major differences. So first of all, the panel user interface was overhauled to use a more um, newish uh, XTP library for uh, the uh, user interface of the panel. Uh, some class names were also changed, probably for uh, easier readability. For example, the, the audio manager was changed to be the voice manager. And this is actually a nice change, because if we uh, look at a variant and we find a class name that is a camera manager, that would probably indicate that it was uh, based on this newer fork uh, of Ghostrad. Uh, audio and video compression also were introduced, and uh, the kernel manager's on-receive method uh, was changed to uh, handle commands using a callback table instead of a switch case statement. So um, these open source releases coming from the Ghostrat team uh, spawned lots of variants in the wilds, like hundreds of them. So to uh, investigate this a little bit and familiarize ourselves uh, with Ghost, we collected 22 open source forks from various sources. And um, our main goal was to link prominent traits uh, of these notable variants, like pseudo manuscript, for example, to these available forks that are open source. So this would allow us to gain insight into the origins of each variant and its developers' motivations. But like any evolutionary story, there has to be missing links. So um, op these open source variants in our collection that share one or more new traits with Ghost 1.0 Alpha, which is closed source, by the way, um, they all retain old traits from 3.6 beta. Uh, for example, the old class names are still used, and the old kernel manager relying on the switch case statement is also there. So this could indicate that there were some possible leaks that are unknown to us uh, of intermediate releases that happened between 3.6 and 1.0, which we call ghost acts. So uh, to gain more insight into this and uh, to be more on the ground, so we conducted analysis of some closed source variants that are used by distinct uh, threat actor groups, and we tried to establish and understand connections with other variants in our collection. So the first one was Ghost Times, which was first documented by Japan Cert in 2020. It was seen in attacks by Black Tech APT. Uh, they stripped away most features of Ghost 3.6 beta, only left a few managers, uh, but they improved the communication protocol, uh, added bot authentication, authentication, RC4 encryption. Uh, they also implemented two new classes, uh, uh, 
a manager called uh, the Ultra Port Map Manager, which does port forwarding, basically turning the bot into a gateway to connect to internal service, and also uh, a port map manager, which is uh, a proxy feature. So these port map managers are interesting because they have a similar but not the same implementation of an open source tool called ZX Port Map, which is common among Chinese-speaking uh, threat actors and APT groups. So in this case, uh, the transform one mode of this tool, which implements the port forwarding maps to the Ultra Port Map Manager in Ghost Times, and the transfer two and transfer three mode, which work uh, in tandem, uh, uh, they they correspond to the Port Map Manager uh, proxy. So this same name is seen in other variants of Ghost. For example, in BBS RAT, that is uh, operated by the Roman Tiger Group, and also in pseudo manuscript. Uh, these are all similar but distinct implementations. So the second group we saw was Gambling Puppet, which is a sophisticated APT uncovered by Trend Micro in 2022. They're targeting online gambling businesses, operating PlugX, Ghostrat, and other uh, uh, malware. They use multiple modified forks of Ghostrat that all seem to originate from that Ghost X variant we talked about. So we analyzed these samples and uh, we, we saw that, that they actually share some traits with forks in our collection. So the first trait was a unique chat manager called CTEX Chat, which we found in only in one variant in our collection, uh, which allows like the, the operator to chat with the victim. Second one is um, a couple of uh, functions that allow to play with the victim a little bit, like open the CD tray, uh, swap mouse buttons, and this was found in a uh, variant called Terminator Platinum. In addition, uh, this malware has an imp had an improved version of the Ghost MBR Killer, uh, which is shared by bo two variants, Terminator Platinum, mentioned in the previous slide, another variant called Fail VIP 3.0. And it's actually interesting because the Ghost 1.0 alpha version does not have um, uh, an MBR killer. So the presence of code overlap with multiple variants uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in these samples used by the APT indicates a complex origin. We, we, saw, uh, or we saw code originated from multiple variants, and it's really difficult to trace it back to a single source. So we think they probably cherry-picked features from various projects, as it's uh, super easy to do that. Just take the manager class, and you're good to go. And then I'm going to hand it over to Jorge. So now that we have a proper context on where this latest variant set of manuscript is stemming from, we have the history of Ghostrat already present. Now let's delve into this latest fort. As we mentioned before, it was first spot by Kaspersky, July 2021. They reported some similarities with the manuscript malware operated by Lazarus, but since the malware wasn't really the same and they were uncertain whether the developers behind both projects were the same or not, they coined the moniker set of manuscript. Worth to mention here, we are not attributing this one to Lazarus in any way. It was brought to our attention in 2022 and later that year, in October, we started tracking it. And very soon after we put our tools in place, we realized this thread was rather active, with motivate, which motivated us to have a proper and deeper look to improve our tracking, collection, and, and the, the data we were collecting from it. And that's where, when Chuhil realized the, the Ghostrat connection leading to this research we are presenting today. Again, this is an ongoing situation. The group is still active. As we speak, they are trying to grow the botnet, and for doing so, they are mainly using two delivery methods. The first one of them is fake crack software, where you will turn to your search engine of choice, try to look for some activator or some crack tool to save a few bucks, but in turn, you are running malware as a volunteer on your own. And the other one is install services. That's why we claim here they are following a spray and pray approach for distribution. We haven't observed any targeted campaigns towards any business or sector or country or region for that matter. 
since they are using this spray and pray approach, they need a way in the back end to identify where certain bot is coming from, and that's why they have this campaign identifier, which is composed of four numbers, like 3003, and they are writing this value in the registry under the SEO ID key. So this will allow them ideally in the back end to track infections. Moving on into the install services, when we started tracking this threat, they were only using one install service, the one which the actors from private loader offer. We are also certain they are not targeting any specific region when it comes to delivery because they are using the install service version of the business, which allows them to spread the binaries to any country in the world. For example, some of these install services offer installs to worldwide locations, or only Europe, or only the USA, which are more expensive than the worldwide. And this one is using the worldwide option. We think they are also learning as they continue their operation, because when we started tracking it, they were only using private loader for delivery. My guess here is that at some point, they realize that using the same install service again, again, and again, would lead their payloads to be executed on the very, very same computers again, again, and again. That's why in late 2022, they started diversifying the install service they use. They started with one, and nowadays they are using at least four, as far as we can see. And it's interesting because it looks like they tried another install service which another actor offers through an Amadei botnet. Also, they have a test uh, at another service which some other actor offers through a smoke loader botnet. Perhaps it didn't pay off very well. They went back to their origins, private loader, but then they, they found the key to delivery, and they started using a different service every two days. So every two days, they will switch from Amadei to private loader, to smoke loader, to Elgook loader, to start again the, the very next week, hopefully getting a wider reach and growing their botnet as much as they can. So the infection chain of pseudo-manuscript starts with uh, download, obviously, of the downloader component, either from the soft a software delivery network for fake cracks or from a malware loader, as we saw. So the downloader component first will restart itself, elevate it, and then we download two files. So the first file is a PNG image with uh, a shell called loader DLL that is uh, encrypted in its overlay data. So this DLL, named db.dll, will be dropped to the user's temporary directory. The second file is uh, a binary file with an HTML extension uh, with its name being set to the campaign ID. So this is saved uh, in the temporary directory as well um, as, as a db.dat file. So the downloader component would uh, run uh, the run DLL32 uh, executable with uh, db.dll and invoke a special export called open. And um, the db.dll would read uh, the encrypted shell codes from the db.dat file. So this file stores 32-bit and 64-bit shellcodes, uh, each preceded with its length, uh, with, um, uh, encoded by adding a simple value, which was always the same since the inception of pseudo-manuscript. And at this stage, only the 32-bit shellcode is used. So this shellcode is decrypted in two rounds. First round involves an XOR, um, with uh, the key depending on the index of, uh, of the byte in the, in the file. And then the second round involve, uh, involves a reverse XOR algorithm where the first byte is the last byte's key and each byte is then its previous key until reaching the, the, the beginning of the file. So this shellcode itself, being decrypted, will decrypt and load and invoke the core module of pseudo manuscript, which is uh, embedded in the shellcode and encrypted with a one byte XOR key and is compressed with the LZNT1 algorithm. So at this stage, the core module is running inside the run DLL32 instance uh, in its first execution. 
and this time it would persist the appropriate shellcode uh, for the system system's architecture uh, in the registry. So it will read the db.dhe file, encrypt the proper shellcode, and then persist it. And then it would inject a remote thread into the currently running SVC host instance for the net services group. Um, and this instance would um, read that persisted shellcode, inject it via process hollowing into a new SVC host, SVC host instance, which will be the main instance of sudo manuscript. And this instance is the one responsible for talking with the command and control server. So these two instances would actually monitor each other. So if one of them is terminated, the other would start, would start it. So persistence here is performed only during system shutdown. Uh, by registering a callback using the set control, set console, control handler uh, API. So this uh, function would be invoked um, at, at when a lot of events happen, including the system shutdown. So this automatically means that an unexpected shutdown, for example, due to a blue screen of death, means that sudo manuscript will not persist on the system. So this persistence is done uh, using a service DLL that is embedded inside the core module. Uh, this DLL is copied to the system32 directory, and then um, a new service group is registered uh, in, the regist in the registry that is called uh, app service. So this service would start uh, after the system reboot. It will read the persisted shellcode from the registry and then inject it into uh, svchost.exe, um, uh, the net services group instance, and then the infection would go on from there like we saw on the previous slide. So the malware configuration is stored in the data section of the core component. There are two configuration buffers, uh, a primary one, which is always used, and then uh, a secondary one that is only used when a special command is received from the command and control server to switch. So when this command is received, sudo manuscript would create a new uh, file extension association uh, in the registry uh, to uh, uh, switch to this, to this uh, other configuration. So when, when it runs the next time, it will check if this association exists. If it does, it will use the secondary configuration. So the configuration format starts with uh, the main and fallback protocols to use. Uh, the value one is for TCP and value two is for UDP. And in all cases, we've seen that UDP is used as, as the main protocol. So these two fields are followed by the ports to use. So port 53 will be used for the main protocol, which is UDP, and port 443 for the fallback protocol TCP. So the next field is the primary command and control server, um, followed by the DGA parameters in case this server is unreached. So uh, the fallback domain generation algorithm seed string follows. Uh, it's equal to API key and then uh, domain generation algorithms uh, top-level domain, which is .com in this case. Uh, and the last field is uh, an integer that determines uh, the maximum numbers of domains to generate before trying again and communicating with the main C2. So the DGA works by taking um, a domain seed and a string seed. So the domain seed at first is the main C2. It will be concatenated with the API key uh, using a comma, MD5 hashed, and then 10 Characters in the middle would be taken, uh, converted to uppercase, and then they would un undergo a small transformation that would yield uh, a lowercase string that would be concatenated with the top-level domain, in this case, .com. And that would give the um, uh, domain that is to be uh, contacted. So if communication fails with this domain, the, the, the algorithm would use, use it as a seed for the next domain and so on until that maximum number we talked about is reached. So the communication protocol relies on uh, the open source HP socket C++ framework developed by uh, Chinese developers. It is a high performance TCP, UDP, HTTP communication framework that's offering client and server capabilities. Um, the framework uses the KCP protocol uh, when communicating with UDP, uh, when uh, automatic repeat request error control is used. So KCP is a custom protocol, also developed by a Chinese developer, uh, that is described as being 30% to 40% faster than TCP. So pseudo manuscript, as we saw, uses UDP as its main communication protocol, uh, which in this case, uh, KCP, and TCP as a fallback. 
So this use of KCP uh, in pseudo-manuscript um, can be attributed to the capabilities of the library itself uh, rather than being a deliberate design choice uh, by the developers. So the packet header here uh, starts with a header magic, which this time is only one byte, which is always OX43. Uh, it's followed by a transformation type that dictates the format of the uh, packet data. So this uh, transformation type can have multiple values. Uh, the data can be in plain text, XORed, sadly compressed, uh, etc. But the most popular one we saw in we see in multiple commands is the Zlib plus uh, XOR algorithm. And if you remember, Ghostrat uh, uses Zlib for compression. So the other two fields uh, are kind of similar to what we saw in Ghostrat, the packet size, including the header size, and then the size of the uh, untransformed packet. So pseudo-manuscript was directly based on Ghostrat or some variants that it's directly linked to because it misses changes uh, that we see in later variants. Uh, it also doesn't include any audio or video compression. And it only shares a few attributes with open source variants that are in our collection. For example, it has a similar but uh, more advanced service manager to a variant uh, called Bobo Remote Control. So pseudo-manuscripts developers improved on existing managers from Ghostrat, but also added new ones. For example, in uh, the second version, I think, they added the hidden VNC manager, uh, which was um, a fork of tiny nuke hidden VNC, which they broke down into multiple commands. And then they also added bidirectional clipboard sharing between the operator's machine and uh, the infected host. There's also the port map manager, which implements the TCP proxy. Um, an NSTAT manager allowing exfiltration and to close UDP and TCP connections, services manager we talked about, and then uh, uh, a registry editor, basically. So pseudo-manuscript also supports plugins, which are always requested after the first check-in. So uh, the C2 would answer with a list of entries uh, from which interesting fields are the plugin hash in MD5, the start type, either if it wants to start a plugin or uninstall it, and the plugin type uh, if it's an executable or DLL. But we've only seen DLL up to DLLs up to this point. So the bot will follow up with requests to only receive new plugins that it doesn't have uh, stored uh, in the registry. So the first one is a Clipper plugin, which would monitor Clipper data for wallet addresses that are copied by the victim, uh, patch them on the fly to operator-controlled wallets, um, and these addresses, these attacker-controlled addresses, are hard-coded and are the same across all campaigns, uh, giving credit to the idea that uh, there's probably one group behind this threat. So we've taken a look at these wallet addresses and tallied up uh, a sum that is equal to $187 currently in these wallets, and pretty much of it is still there, actually. So the next plugin is a keylogger plugin that will complement the existing keylogger uh, implemented in key Keyboard Manager. So unlike the Keyboard Manager, which needs a special command to be activated, this keylogger would immediately start monitoring the foreground window for substrings uh, that are related to cryptocurrency. And these logs are, will be forwarded in real time. They won't be written to any files. They will be forwarded to real time, uh, in real time to the C2 uh, using a callback that is provided by the core module uh, at plugin initialization. So the other plugin uh, we see is a man-in-the-middle plugin called setProxy. So what it does, it, it's, it will allow the interception of secure browser TLS traffic for specific websites. So what it will do is first add a root certificate to the trusted authority search store. Uh, so this certificate is long lived and will stay valid until 2032. Uh, what it then does is it will add a proxy auto configuration script to the global proxy settings of the system, which are inherited by all browsers. Uh, and this will point to a URL that will download a file called a uh, JavaScript file called win.pac. So when the user navigates to a, web a website, uh, the browser would download this file, cache it, and then match uh, request hosts on, on, on this, using this, this script. So here, it will match cryptocurrency websites, and then if there's a match, it will forward uh, the traffic to the, the proxy in red. So what this proxy does, it will provide a fake certificate that is generated by the malicious 
uh, certification authority, and then this malicious proxy uh, can be used by the actors to intercept TLS traffic and um, get access to cred user credentials. So the next plugin is a stealer plugin that is uh, focused on stealing cookies and saved credentials from various browsers. Uh, it does extensive targeting for Instagram, possibly to compromise account with, uh, accounts with a high follow count. Uh, also targets Facebook and Facebook's ads manager in a similar way that Fabuki does, but we didn't see any, uh, we couldn't establish any code uh, relationships between the two. Uh, so Facebook's ad manager uh, comprom compromising would uh, let the actors run uh, malvertising campaigns, for example. Uh, in this case, the stealer communicates with a different C2 uh, over HTTPS, but it's still sending the uh, campaign ID and the bot ID uh, to this, com to this uh, command and control server. So what's interesting is that our emulated bots receive no commands besides to download and start plugins and to update the bot to a new version. So this led us to think that this is probably a plugin-oriented operation because uh, all plugins we see are oriented towards harvesting credentials and stealing cryptocurrency, and possibly the core bot commands uh, could only be used for interesting bots uh, for example, uh, they they would uh, open a hidden VNC session to the to the host when they want to impersonate uh, the user. So we uh, concluded that this was a financially motivated group, um, and they were likely Chinese-speaking actors because of some patterns we saw. For example, the trend of forking ghost trap. Uh, the use of libraries that were developed by uh, Chinese developers, such as the HP Socket framework. They're also using a Chinese uh, panel called Pagoda Panel to operate some infrastructure, uh, but also their old infrastructure was uh, hosted in the Eastern uh, Asian region. So to conclude, uh, Ghostrad is an old threat that is still appealing to threat actors, possibly because of its well-designed and modular structure. Um, we saw that pseudo-manuscript is an advanced variant that is currently financially successful and is ever-growing, so it is actually more relevant than ever, uh, especially since operators are diversifying and ramping up their distribution. Uh, and given the botnet size, which is pretty big, uh, it can already be used as spyware to spy on victims because the functionality is already there. Uh, for example, we saw that it's uh, exfiltrating the uh, that it can exfiltrate the Tencent uh, QQ number, which, would, which could be used to spy on Chinese nationals outside of China, uh, seeing that they, they're, they're uh, infecting victims from all over the world. Uh, but it also had, has other spyware functionalities. Um, and that's it for us. Thank you. Time for questions. You know everything now already? <laughs> They're all sleeping in. Eric, you don't have a, det a detection question? <laughs> One, two, three. Okay, thank you very much.